The Ink and Paint Club podcast is intended for mature audiences. These guys can't go by like three seconds without saying a swear, so, you know, listener discretion is advised. It's not the beard on the outside that counts, it's the beard on the inside. (laughs) Sure, words have never been spoken. You're listening to the Ink and Paint Club podcast, a proud member of the Geekly Grind podcast network. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ink and Paint Club podcast for this week. My name is JD. I am joined by my good friends, Kyle. Me, how Kylan. And Matt. <laughs> you fucker. I was going to say that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And this week, we are here to talk about Disney's latest uh, theatrical film, Raya and the Last Dragon. Um, I think this actually came out last week, but when has that ever stopped us? Um, Yep, so Raya is out. Uh, You can go see it in theaters if you want to be like me and brave it. Or you can uh, pay Disney Plus's premium access fee and watch it at home. Some of us don't have the fortune of having our theaters back open, J.D., it's true. And even people who do have them open aren't uh, as ballsy as me and my vaccinated I, wife. So I, I think I saw like Cinemark is opening around us. So I think that was literally that. Yeah, I think L- L.A. County announced today that I think they're starting to open up more theaters. Uh, my own county, I think maybe potentially later in the week might be announcing that. I don't know. But yeah. um, J.D., so when you went to the theater, like how many people were actually in your theater? Um, so I think including me and Melanie, I think maybe there's a total of 10 people. Cause um, they do that thing where they like block off every row. And then yeah, when you um, buy your tickets, they close off like the seats right next to your group. Yeah. Something. So basically the way, at least the theater by my house has it. And I think it's pretty much the same, um, at the surrounding theaters in my area, um, is that they've got everything down to about, I think they said 40% capacity, um, when you buy, cause you got to buy tickets like ahead of time. Now it's the whole thing. Um, or, so, you know, select your seats. Uh, they'll automatically mark off the seats, uh, on both sides of you. So you're always like spaced out one or two seats from the people around you. Um, so yeah, it, they're, I mean, they're not getting a whole lot of business cause you know, not a, a lot of people are, you know, wanting to go out to the theaters again yet. Um, but Melanie and I were just like, Melanie's fully vaccinated. I wear my mask everywhere I go. Um, the movie theaters didn't seem like they were that crowded. So we decided to just give it a chance. And honestly, it wasn't too bad. I mean, the, the movie theater was really good about it. They have signages and, uh, pre-show videos about like, Hey, make sure you're wearing your mask unless you're eating. So, um, they're, they're staying on top of that stuff. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm I'm really looking forward to going back to the theater again now that I've already got like, you know, my first part of my uh, uh, Pfizer. So like, you know, just a matter of time before I'm fully vaccinated and I'll be able to brave those theaters as soon as they open up back over here because I fucking missed it. I've I've missed it so much. Yeah. Um, But before we get into the actual movie, uh, Matt, you were saying that the home releases do not have the animated short in front of it. Not that I'm aware of, um, although I will admit that I didn't watch this on Disney Plus, so we'll take that as you will. Um, I don't, but I don't know if the short that is paired with this movie in theaters is on Disney Plus. I didn't read anyone talking about it, um, so I'm not sure if it's just exclusive yeah. to theaters right now. And then Wikipedia, Wikipedia is in theaters. It's accompanied by the short. Um, yeah. I did see the short because I went and saw it in theaters, so I, I guess I can talk about it real quick. Um, the short is called Us Again. Um, it basically set around, centers around this old couple um, and it, it, sets, it takes place in what I assume is New York and the main <laughs> mode of transportation is dance. Uh, literally, huh. literally every character in the street is just dancing uh, like music is playing the whole time. And it's like this this old woman is with this. Her, she's married to this grumpy old guy and he just wants to sit in his chair and and block out the noise of the world. And she like wants them to get up and dance. Cause like it shows them when they were younger and they just like would dance all over the city and like, you know, all that kind of stuff. And she tries to get him to get up and he's like, no, I'm going to sit in my chair. Um, but so she just like kind of sadly leaves the apartment that they live in and starts, you know, goes outside and stuff, but it starts raining. And for some reason, this magic rain allows the two old people to like revert back to, their younger selves uh which gives you know the old guy kind of the the energy to 
you know, they, you know, they do a, you know, a dance number, um, uh, through the streets and like up to a pier, uh, like one of, you know, like those, uh, pier carnival kind of things that, you yeah. know, those yeah. coast cities have. Um, but the, uh, the rain like starts, um, like going out to sea. So you can see like the line of the rain, um, like going out and then they like, they drift out of the rain and like the transition from the young selves back down to the old selves is actually pretty seamless. Um, so they jump like jump back and forth between like the rain and uh, and uh, the dry area, and the body will just switch back and forth like on a dime. So like that's really well done. Um, but it gets to the end where it's just like the rain has gone out to sea. They're both old again. Um, and it really shows that like the old man was just like I just don't have the energy to like to dance the way I used to as a kid. But it was kind of like them discovering that like hey we're old, but doesn't mean we can't enjoy life still. Uh, so they start dancing together at the end, like, but more of like a slow kind of like easier pace, not like trying to keep up with all the young people in the streets. Um, so it's just kind of a sweet little thing about, you know, old people trying to regain their youth and learning that like, Hey, just cause you know, you're older doesn't mean you, you can't experience life. So, um, yeah, it was a cute little short. I, I liked it. Um, and I'm not really big for like, dance and music numbers um i'm already snoring um, <laughs> i will say the one an interesting point uh, an interesting thing that they did with the the short is that there are no um uh like environmental sound effects it is literally just music there's like not really you don't hear uh like it like any cars going by you don't hear any people's like footsteps or anything um it's pretty much just straight music with animation. So, um, and, and it's not like a thing where they use the musical instruments to simulate, uh, other sound effects. No, it's, it, it's, it's pretty much just a straight, uh, uh, a straight real world thing, obviously without the, the body aging thing, but, um, no, okay. it's, it's just, it's just set to a soundtrack and, uh, no, it's, it's a cute little short. It's, it, and it's obviously the environment is really well done. It's like, I'm sure we'll talk uh, about it in this movie where it's like, borderline realistic um yeah. yeah um yeah because i was gonna ask because typically a lot of those times for the shorts that they do for um for disney movies it's typically uh, a lot of the time it's them testing out like tech uh to see for use like in a in a in a larger release uh or like a larger feature so I it's could... so it sounds like the one for this was kind of like an aging uh, tech or something right i could see this as um working on choreography um, because as we'll talk about with Raya, like the fight choreography is really uh, is a is a big highlight for Raya, and this entire short is like completely dance choreographed. Okay, um, okay. Like there is there like other than like yeah, like I'd say like ninety percent of it is is dance choreography. Um, so like you know, obviously you got to kind of plot that kind of stuff out. So um, I I could see that where that's like this is what we're we're trying to focus and really trying to get a a better dance on like uh expressive really complicated human motion um and so i, I guess for raya i guess like trying to get that fight choreography and dance choreography can kind of be somewhat related so i could see them wanting to work on that sure sure yeah that was uh yeah well i mean we'll definitely talk about it in the actual review but yeah the the, the fight stuff and uh, raya is definitely unlike any that i can remember in recent memory for um for uh, disney films it's actually mm -hmm. like very good action yeah, uh, but we can get into Raya now. Um, so yep, Raya and the Last Dragon, it's out now. Um, I think it was supposed to be back out in like November, November I think. November originally, but it got pushed back as for, you know, obvious reasons. Um, but Raya is set place in a, you know, it's a fictional uh, land, but it takes play or it takes inspiration from a lot of like uh, South Far East uh, countries like China uh, Mongolia, um, some of the like more southern eastern countries, the Philippines. Uh, yeah, Philippines. So kind of like that. It so it's got it's got a lot of different uh, influences on here, and it kind of blends. I think they blend them pretty well together. Um, but basically, it, it's a fantasy land where dragons used to roam free, uh, but these shadow creatures called the the Droon, these like purple shadow smoke monsters, 
that can turn people into stone, um, awaken the uh, the dragons have to fight them back. But uh, in a last ditch effort, the last dragons uh, use their power to create a, a, a magical gem that can ward off the druid and uh, like basically lock them away. Um, this stone ends up becoming like a focus point for like all of the different um, parts of this country to the point where they split up into factions uh, because they like they're all jealous of like the um, the 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 it, it's called heart because each tribe is like based on um, a part of the dragon because there's like a big river uh, that's shaped like the dragon and uh, the tribes are based on like what part of the dragon uh, body they're on. So it's like fang, spine, tail, heart. Um, I forget what the other one is. There's like five. Yeah. Uh, Talon, that was the other one. Oh, okay. um, and heart and heart has the the dragon gem and all these other uh, uh, tribes want this gem because they think it like uh, brings uh, prosperity and just like better uh, just better luck to that to that tribe because heart is like a thriving society um, where the other ones are maybe not doing as well. Um, Raya is this. Uh, like she is, she is a Disney princess. Maybe not traditional sense. She's like a warrior princess. Basically, her dad is the chief of 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 the Heart Tribe, um, but he is convinced that we can bring everybody together. Uh, so he invites all the other tribes together. But um, Raya tries to make friends with a a, a little girl um, from one of the other tribes. Betrayed uh, the. Long story short, the dragon gem gets broken. Everybody takes a piece, runs off with it, and that brings the Druun back because uh, breaking the gem uh, lets the Druun out of their prison, I guess. Right, and then it just... They do, like, a big time skip. Like, after, like, a bunch of people have already been turned to stone, they do a time skip, like, six years later, and then that's where the rest of the movie kind of takes place. Right, so, yeah, it's 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 like... It uh Raya basically becomes a warrior of the wasteland, uh roaming around trying to recollect all the dragon pieces because if she she thinks that if she does this, uh she can bring back uh Sisu, the last dragon, to basically just fix everything. Well, I think the no, because I think the whole point was trying to get the gems back just to bring the people back. I think the finding finding Sisu was like a separate thing. Or, or no, right. or, well, no, actually, no, you you the, might be right. The, no, whole, the whole thing was finding her so she could put the gem back together. That's what it was. Okay, yeah, because yeah, right. the ETC's power to stick it back together. Sure, sure. Um, before we talk about the, uh, the 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 actual plot or anything any further, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about the production stuff because, of, of course. Yeah, um, go for it. The movie was originally announced in uh, 2019 at, like, the D23 Expo. Uh, I think they mm-hmm. were talking about a movie called, like, kingdoms or something before bef- like some years before that which i guess evolved into that and derived mm-hmm. the last dragon um as far as the directors are concerned uh there's co-direction although th- this is something that I, I discovered which i think is pretty weird um typically a lot of these animated features from disney they tend to have th- there tend to be co-directed but even then like um i was i noticed in the credits i saw like you know oh the, there's the directors there's two directors and then like the credit after that was also co-directed by so this technically like i i don't know if they're like on a different rung of co-direction but at least on all the proper credits that's just the two main co-directors but there's mm-hmm. also i'm imagining it's probably just like directors of animation and that sort of thing but that's not what they call it so um i don't actually know for certain but anyway the two main directors that they credit there's a carlos lopez estrada who's actually fairly new to disney uh this is actually his first directorial credit for an animated film Hmm. Um, because I think he came on like around 2018, 2019. He mostly has experience in working with um in um uh, live action stuff. Like he'd worked in some other live action uh, films and cinema and stuff. Um, but the other co-director, who's like the more you know tenured um uh, animation person, uh, Dan Hall, who oh no sorry Don Hall, um, he co-directed uh the 2011 Winnie the Pooh movie and also hmm. co-directed um 2014's Big Hero Six. Oh, okay. um, which honestly when i was watching this movie and kind of like watching the action and stuff i was trying to think like when the when was the last time i saw a disney movie that really had 
like action like this. And I was thinking Big Hero Six, and when I found out that he co-directed that one as well, that made more sense. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, and then as far as like you know the the two main like you know you got Varya and Sisu the dragon, um, mm-hmm. and they're the ones that kind of have like you know you know quote unquote big names attached because a lot of the characters in the movie they're voiced by you know probably larger names probably in Asian territories and stuff. I mean like I recognize like Sandra O oh and stuff, and I know that Benedict Wong played Wong in like you know the MCU. Um, mm-hmm. But other than that, and then of course there's Alan Tudyk who you know is d- voicing a creature because of you know he's Alan Tudyk, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, actually it movie. was it was weird because um, when going into this movie and even like looking through the voice cast, um, like while I was in the theater, Aquafina was the only person I like knew by name, um, and even then I'm not even really familiar like what she does. I know she's like a rapper, a comedian person, and she's been a ton of other movies too. Like yeah, the, the yeah. Big, the, Big one that I know she was in was Crazy Rich Asians, which was like really popular. Yeah, and I think she was in that like Ocean's Eleven reboot with the the, was, the all females Ocean Eleven. I think she was in she that. She was in the Angry Birds movie. Oh, right. so so that was something I was going to bring up was that the the two main voice actresses are Aquafina and Kelly Marie Tran, who and I thought that the other people knew this, but JD didn't know this. Um, Kelly Marie Tran is mostly known for playing Rose in the um, the last in. New Star Wars, Jedi, yeah. yeah. In the Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker, um, I yeah. thought this was her. I thought this was her first uh, animated feature role because I know she's voiced Rose in some like you know Lego Star Wars stuff and all that. So mm-hmm. I thought this was her first animated feature, but actually she does a main character in the newest Cruise movie as well, oh. um, which I had no idea about until I read that. And I was like, yeah. oh, okay, that's pretty neat. I kind of forgot that um, movie came out, and then I saw it at the store the other day, and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was the thing. <laughs> um, right. And then Aquafina, this is like her fourth uh, voice role in an animated feature because, like uh, Kyle mentioned, she was in uh, the Angry Birds sequel in 2019. Mm-hmm. She was also in Storks from 2016, and then she was oh. also in uh, Sponge on the Run, you know, the third SpongeBob movie. Oh, that's right, she was. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did. I did like going through it. Uh, the voice cast. Now, I did recognize a couple of people. Um, we already mentioned Benedict Wong, who um, at least I just know him. He's 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 been getting around the last couple of years, but I know him as like from the MCU. And then I think he was like in like uh, Marco Polo. I think that that's on Netflix. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sandra O's in here. I think most people know her from Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, that's um, she's probably like the largest name on there. The person that like I don't know her name, but as soon as it was um, Lucille Song, I think that's how you pronounce her. Song Sing. It's like S O O N G. Um, she was um, in the Daredevil. Uh, netflix show um oh was she um she was she, like the kind of like the the it was related to the hand right uh yeah i'm trying to pull up come on netflix or it's been a while since i watched daredevil i think i know the character you're talking about is it i think it maybe that was i think that was her yeah uh, like i can no, visualize actually, who it was but i can't, I can't never remember mind. Like, i don't think that's her never mind <laughs> i thought that, it was no it's it's not her uh i think i'm thinking of a different old Chinese lady. They're just uh, all the same to you, huh? Oof. Oof. No, like I like <laughs> she sound, like she sounded really familiar in the movie because she she plays the um that old um the the Talon chief um the old lady that like throws rot or throws um Sisu out to the outside of the gates to the the drone. Um I thought I like I thought it sounded familiar and I was like, that's not Betty White, is it? Oh um, god. Because I was like, I, I know this voice. Um, I'm sure Lucille's like done stuff I've seen. I just um, not seeing anything off off the right off the top of my head here. So my bad. Um, the one last credit I wanted to bring up just because it, it was kind of funny to me was uh, uh, the person who composed the score for this movie was James Newton Howard, who has composed for three other animated features features for Disney, but he hasn't composed for them since 2002. So he went hmm. through a period. In 2000, 2001 to 2002, he composed Dinosaur, Atlantis, and Treasure Planet. I like the. Well, I don't never seen Dinosaur, but I like those other two. No, but what <laughs> I think is hilarious is like, you know, all three of those movies are well known. Like, you know, Atlantis and Treasure Planet have, you know, large followings, but they did not do well financially. So I sure didn't. <laughs> so I, I think that's hilarious that he didn't compose anything else for Disney until now. Like, he just, <laughs> he like, composed for like three flops and then. I'm assuming dinosaur flop. I remember watching that theater. I don't remember shit about it. Yeah, I don't remember that doing well. I, it, like, I, like it, I said, I've never seen it. It did good enough for them to make a ride at Florida. Oh, did they? 
Huh. Yeah. I remember owning like it wasn't a novelization of the movie. It was like an it was like an activity book, but it was like in novel format. And I just remember like there being Mad Libs and like some other shit. Like nice. it was yeah. I I don't remember much about it. I remember vividly having it. But anyway, yeah, um, yeah. That's all. Just the credit stuff I wanted to bring up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it about the double, movie. It made double its movie. I wouldn't call dinosaur a flop. Well, I mean, when when taking into consideration that it's by Disney, uh, I'm sure like they have h- much higher expectations than just doubling. Yeah. Like, like fucking. Um, uh, what was it? Um, I was talking with somebody the other day. Um, recently, uh, they re-released uh, James Cameron's Avatar movie back in the theaters, and it oh, re yeah. it re overtook uh, Avengers Endgame as like the most profitable movie of all time. I did. Um, but for modern times, because obviously Gone with the Wind is always going to hold that title for non-inflation. Right. Um, but it got on the topic of like, you know, oh, it's been so far removed from when the original came out that there's like those three planned sequels. And there's absolutely no way in hell that fucking like Avatar 2 is going to make anywhere near the amount of money that Avatar 1 did. There's like a very specific set of circumstances as to why it made that m- that amount of money and stuff that I'm not going to go into here. Um, but you know, just related to like the 3d right. craze and all that shit, let's, but like do it, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it's like, um, it's, yeah, I don't know, man. It's, I, I it's, it's just so fucking weird. Um, so the, oh, the, okay. The point I was trying to make was that even if avatar two ends up being in like the 10 most profitable movies of all time, comparatively to how much money avatar one made, it will be viewed as a box office failure or oh, not a box man. office failure, but like as a flop comparatively. Um, right. And so much so that uh, Disney might not even go unless they're filming all that shit, like back to back to back, like the three sequels, they might not, not even go through with the other sequels. It's kind of like one of those things where like they, there was how much time between like uh, Tron and Tron legacy. Um, oh, and now yeah. there's, now there's this time between Tron legacy and this third Tron movie that they're trying to make. That's like, you know, they're, they're not willing to go through with like the sequels around the time that they're making the other sequels. Like they wait for enough time for there to, you know, build up like nostalgia, I guess. But like, who the fuck has nostalgia for avatar? Like nobody remembers shit about that movie. Except for like, gonna make it, how are they going to make a Tron movie without Def Punk? Yeah, really. Well, I mean, you know, they made the first movie without Daft Punk, so it's all CG. I mean, just you know, just make them CG robots. Uh, I'm still fucking tore up about the Daft Punk thing. Yeah. Anyway, everyone, everyone thought they were gonna come back and do the score for uh, this third one too, and now that that's not happening, I'm thinking like, who the hell can they get to fill those shoes? Because that soundtrack is fucking baller. That's a banger, man. Didn't uh, <laughs> What a anyway. downgrade. Uh, I, could go, I could go. I could go on about fucking that too, but uh, let's, right. let's, let's, let's actually let's actually talk about the movie. Let's yeah. do it. I want to hear. Well, well, so Kyle, what? Let's just get our like base opinions out of the way on this movie. How how did you feel? Uh, I liked it for the most part, but there's a lot of things that I'm just fucking exhausted about. I'm tired of seeing Disney princess movies, even though that wasn't like the whole fucking thing. Just tired of the idea of a disney princess movie right well so... at least the, at least this one is very non-traditional in that sense it didn't play out like yeah. other but I, I i definitely see what kyle is meaning that like it is it is it is technically a disney princess it is about a princess yeah yeah but they never draw attention um, to that fact really no kind no, of at the beginning but that's about it yeah um i'm kind of <laughs> I'm kind of tired of the the whole strong strong female protagonist kind of thing too. Just exhausted from it. Uh, it it happened so much that now it's just it's tiresome. I, I'm sure there's people that'll disagree, but it's like we had Wreck It Ralph and remember what was it Shanks or whatever. Here's a really cool female character, and eh, it's just boring to me. Um, side cut under- hair. Yeah, I, I get what you mean. Like, I, I, like, uh, and in certain respect, I I agree. Like, but like, it, it, it's just this thing where you know, it's I imagine it's, they're just trying to make up for lost time. You know, there's like a very big demand for this sort of thing now, and because they've gone 
so long in fucking Hollywood without there being like, you know, if, if, if this would have been like, I think from the start, there would have been like, you know, equal representation all around, like then it wouldn't be, it wouldn't seem like they're trying to push it as hard as they have been, obviously. Um, I think, I True. think it's just them just trying to make up for like lost time and shit, you know, True, they got to put it in, bubble in now. Keep this in mind. We've had frozen two. We have strong female protagonist. We have mm. Moana strong female protagonist. We have Zootopia, strong female protagonist. You know what I mean? Reina, strong female protagonist. Kind of want to see something different at this time. <laughs> sure. It's been going on since 2016. I'm, I'm kind of over it now. Um, but that's the thing. We had the gigantic movie was slated, and that sounded like, you know, a um, kind of a break away from this kind of stuff. Because yeah. I'm, I'm kind of happy that it wasn't a musical, and I know a lot of people love the fucking Broadway musical bullshit of Disney, and yeah. I'm kind of happy that that wasn't in there, and it was more oh action. Yeah, yeah, it was it was actually kind of funny because um, neither Melanie and I had like knew anything about this movie going in because we hadn't really seen any trailers or or whatever. So we, she even asked me going in, I was like, "Is this a musical?" I'm like, I don't think so, <laughs> but. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm actually. I'm glad this wasn't a musical. Like it was just a good action movie. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I liked it for the most part. It it was fun where it needed to be, and kind of weird. There was a lot of plot stuff that didn't gel well with me. Kind of almost plot hole ish. Like, <laughs> what, was, what was the one thing that you were joking about just before we we just started recording about her dad? Oh, her dad in the very beginning of the movie gets shot in the knee with an arrow and uh, they're running from the, the drone on a bridge and he just chucks her into the river to save herself. And then like 10 seconds pass and then he gets developed. And he had enough time to jump in with her. And that was one thing. But then when he revives, he like runs up to her like nothing happened. It's like, well, he was just shot with an arrow. <laughs> Like I'm pretty sure the arrow turned to stone too. Right. <laughs> yeah, and I was just—I'm sure that was one of those things. Just Wade, Wade was like, "Oh, the fucking the, the dragon magic healed everyone too." Like, <laughs> anytime you see something like that, a wizard did it. Well, um, um, well, no, because then JD made the implication was that they fucking are encased in stone, and they, but then they're not aging, but they're probably aware the whole time or something, right? Is that what you said, JD? I basically just said, like, he's been encased in stone for six years. I'm sure the wound's healed by now. Right. Well, it's not one of those things where they explore, like, oh, like, if if they're just fr- completely frozen in time and it's like, you know, it's no, it, yeah. it's, it's literally one of those things that, like, it did not occur to me that that was a that that was a even a, a, a slight plot hole until Kyle brought it up. Like, it did. Yeah, I didn't, think about, I, I, I didn't think about it either. Like, <laughs> it's one of those things, like, if you're turned to stone and you, like, crumble. Are you going to wake up and be like perfectly dude, fine? Dude, yeah. I was wondering about that because like everyone like when they get frozen, like go into like this uh, like giving hand kind of like the, position. Yeah, like offering. Like, yeah, yeah an off- like an offering position. It's like, what if like just something falls on them and their hand like breaks their hands off? If they get unfrozen, yeah. are they just going to like wake up and they're just blood spurting from their arm stumps? Well, that was the weird thing too was uh, Rhea does that at the end where she does that pose and it, it kind of like forces her into that pose, but the other but, people that are around her yeah, don't go I, in the pose. I was very, con- I was actually really confused. Like I, I get it. It makes for a nice shot, but yeah, I was confused by why at the end when people, when, when the whole team gets turned to stone, why when they surround her, that she's the only one that uh, is forced into that pose. Yeah. It's just, it's the, it's, it is what it is. Literally, I just chalked it up, but it's like we want to make this look cinematically nice. Like it, yeah. it makes for a nice composition. Yeah, but then don't like don't don't like uh, uh, establish like for the whole entire movie that getting hit by the fucking drone that it does that to people because then it's like it's gonna be fucking weird when they do it and it turn and, and they they don't do that. Like they could have right. just as easily made it so that they got frozen in the pose that they were in. 
Like, I, and, and I honestly it. think it was probably done that way because then you could have like a, a whole field of people doing that way and they could probably just copy paste the statues. Yeah. Because they're too, they're, they're far enough away that you can tell what position they're in, but not like to tell the individual details. That, that yeah. makes sense. Jeremy Snow here, owner and editor-in-chief of The Geekly Grind. I'm interrupting your awesome, regularly scheduled programming to ensure that you know about our Geekly Grind podcast network, of which this show is a treasured member of. If you haven't had a chance to check out our site, you can do so at www.thegeeklygrind.com. And while you're there, check out the other members of our steadily growing podcast family, including the anime-centric Blake and Spencer Get Jumped, discovering new heroes and comic book keepers with Chris and Lance, exploring the vast universe of geekdom with Geek Exploration, or, of course, appreciating animation's finer details with the Ink and Paint Club. Escape your weekly grind at the Geekly Grind. The other yeah. thing, too, is they have the pieces of that gem, right? And yeah. she's getting powers back. She's like, oh, yeah, this is from my brother. This is from my sister, that kind of stuff. Okay. She's got the fucking oh. talismans from Jackie Chan Adventures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when they're in the, the floating city, the, the water town, and the pieces get stolen, I was like, oh, is she going to lose her powers because they're connected with the stones? But mm. that never happened because she's walking around as a human. And I was like, oh, shit, is she going to turn into a dragon because of yeah. this? And no, nothing happened. So it's like, then why did she lose all the powers when the stone broke into pieces? Why didn't she just retain all that? You get what I'm uh, saying? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's one uh, of those things where it's like, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> kind of plot holy to me. It, it, it yeah. only matters in world until it they need it to not matter. <laughs> Right. Yeah, basically. <laughs> um, well, Matt, what what did you kind of think of this movie? I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was pretty great. Um, yeah, just like um, like I said, I mean, uh, I hadn't really, and I might just be mistaken. I just can't remember, but there hasn't been like a really actiony Disney movie since Big Hero Six. So, mm-hmm. and even then, that's like superhero action, which is not the same as like you know choreographed like fights with like swords. No, this is like a jail. This is like just borderline a kung fu movie. Yeah. Well, didn't didn't they say that, that they were going to do an R-rated cut or some dumb shit like that? What? What? For, Ry- for Raya and the Last Dragon? Yeah. Who Let the fuck said that? Up that? For you? No way Disney said that. Like, God, they're the like director or something. They're probably joking. It had to have been like a joke because I mean, God, it's it's Disney for God's sake. Like, there's, poor, there's gonna, absolutely no way. We're gonna we're gonna do like a Mortal Kombat. People are gonna get limbs cut off and blood it's flying right everywhere. here. It says, according to the directors of Disney's Ray and the Last Dragon, an R-rated version of the movie exists, but why would they cut so much out? And that's what the thing says. Yeah. The directors yeah. have stated. <laughs> Maybe I, for violence, I don't know. I, Maybe. Yeah, but even then, it's like violent, like, even if like there's a little blood in the movie, like that's not it's, it's PG thirteen at best. Yeah, exactly. Rated R would have to imply that there's like, oh, you know what? That's probably why they didn't show anyone falling apart when they've been turned to stone or anything. Because <laughs> that's R rated cuts. Like, death. Like, yeah, they get fucking like yeah. Put oh, it back says right here. It says there's a cut of the movie with broken bones and stuff just laying around. Oh, geez. Somewhere quoted by the director. Yeah. Uh, that's like some some scary images in it. Hmm. That's not for fucking read it. I, I don't know, man. I, I'm not. I, yeah, you have only, to read this whole. Article. We're not part of the MPAA, but <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll definitely read that later. Right. Um. But yeah, no. Just as far as the movie is concerned, no, I thought it was great. Um. Yeah. No. I mean, I'm hoping that they take the opportunity to do more. Uh, movies like this, because I mean, you know, mm-hmm. Disney has already proved that they can, you know, do certain types of films and. Of course, you know, like Kyle was saying, there's certain hallmarks that this still does share with other Disney movies, but I feel like it also succeeded in attempting a lot of stuff that they don't typically do, um, mm-hmm. and they did it very well. So, um, yeah, it was just it's 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 nice to see them kind of branch out and you know here and there. So, like you know, uh, hopefully, you know, other future movies that we get from them, like like we're getting um we're still get, supposed to be getting like one other Disney animated movie this year, right? Like Encanto. Uh, yeah, in Kanto, yeah, I think that's uh, later this year. 
yeah so i mean you know unless shit gets delayed or whatever um but yeah it'll just be interesting to see where they go from there um there's a lot of yeah it's in november okay there are elements of this movie that i like um when they have not necessarily flashbacks but when they have kind of like like these side aside like dream sequences of like you know when they're putting together plans and stuff they shift to like the cell animated style that looks really good like mm-hmm. within like with the character models and everything like yeah and I, and I was thinking like you know that could definitely been an approach they could have made like they could have made the whole movie look like that would have looked great um, i did i did think that that was kind of like the because like the 2d animation is like very painterly um like kind of watercolory and i did think that would kind of was nice like a nice uh contrast to the 3d animation when you're trying to like tell a, like a flashback or something yeah but like and don't get me wrong like the the, the whole movie looks you know great like you know that's it, i mean it's disney of course it's gonna look you know very good um but th- th- just seeing those sequences i kind of wish we got to see more of them and it would have even been uh, very interesting to see if they would have done like the whole movie that way or something because like <laughs> i said it, it, because they're so used to doing movies a certain way like i don't think that they would do that but um, Are you talking about the uh, the heist scene where the little boy said his plan and it was all like drawn? Yeah, but there was like a, a, some other parts in the movie where they do that as well, and I, I maybe those were flashbacks because that reminded me of the, the fucking shitty game that they keep advertising. It's like sorcerers something. <laughs> like, uh, it looked like the same style as the uh, the cell phone ads. Sort I okay. I I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but I I, I, get, I, 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 I think I know which game he's talking about, but I <laughs> I wouldn't have drawn that comparison. I just thought it looked really cool. It kind of reminded me of um, it reminded me of the visual style that uh, Marvel vs. Capcom three has. Um, and I specifically thought about it because there's like CG animated things in that style, and it just that that's you know that cell animated style just kind of reminded me of that, and I thought that was cool. Yeah, it's it's like Sorcerer's <laughs> Arena. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, it's it's a lot of like heavy like paint effects and um like a lot of brush stroke kind of animation. So Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. That was kind of cool. Um the credit sequence was pretty cool too. It's like kind of done in the style like the tapestry that you see uh, in the uh, in the movie. Mm-hmm. That was very cool. Um I the, the my favorite part of the movie was um I really, I really liked uh, uh, the sword that Rai used in this movie because it's <laughs> She's basically got a fucking violet chain sword. No, it's fucking it's Ivy's sword from Soul Calibur. Oh like, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, I think where it breaks apart into pieces and uses it like a whip. Uh, the only other movie where I've ever seen a sword like that is um, and and it actually wasn't a sword, but it was like a belt or something. But uh, in Scott Pilgrim versus the World, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Roxy uses it. Yeah, uh, but it's got that same sort of effect to it. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if when they choreograph the sequences in for this movie, because I'm I'm assuming they would have used like you know real people doing that stuff and then referenced it because you mm-hmm. know um, I'm wondering if they did the same thing they did in Scott Pilgrim where they used um, they used kind of like a flowy like um, it's not like a ballet thing but it's like um, um, <sighs> shit I I can't remember the name of it um, it's like some sort of yeah okay I, i'm not even gonna try to embarrass myself and like say something that it isn't but like it, yeah i wonder if they did the same thing i, I think uh, i know what you're talking about yeah um, um it, it being used like as a grappling hook and shit too is very cool mm-hmm. like um it, it, there's not like a ton of sequences where we get to see like it, like in the action sequences yes but um and then in a couple sequences here and there where we see it used for like traversal and stuff oh actually you know what something i forgot to write down that i really enjoyed too was um what is the name of the character that Alan Tudyk voices? The fucking big Tuck uh, Tuck Tuck Tuck. Yeah. I I that visual of like the roly poly thing with like the harness on top and like riding it around like that is fucking cool. Like that was yeah, that was pretty that sweet. Was it's very cool looking. Um, yeah, just a lot of cool <laughs> visuals in this movie all around. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> um, I mean, it it, it is is definitely like falls into the trope of like you know disney princess needs a a funny animal sidekick and yeah and that's uh, that's something from disney movies that i'm i'm getting a little like and dude, you know yeah dude I, as soon as i saw tuck tuck like i'm like okay we're gonna make plush we're gonna make dolls out of this thing but then they make him fucking huge like he's a bear pill bug thing and i'm like okay that's kind of cool but yeah we're gonna sell like a million toys at this thing yeah um that's why they do it 
I mean, yeah, yeah it, it, he he is. Uh, Talk Talk screams marketing decision. Yeah, and they they need to sell like plushes and toys and merchandise. No, I mean, I, I mean, the it. whole thing is they have her in this post-apocalyptic thing. She fucking says it like the first line or whatever, and giving her a a pseudo motorcycle seems like a more no, story like, thing than like I, I I could see like I, I'm I'm saying that like. His application in the movie is cool. Like I, yeah. I like what they do with him. His design is marketing. No, it could have been it, 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 like, and this is the most egregious offender that I can think of is um, for when Moana came out. Oh, they God. had like they had a ton of merchandise for, and, and not not. I think his name was Hi Hi, who was also voiced by Alan Tudyk, actually. The pig. Um, okay. No, the the, the, the rooster. All oh, right, and I was gonna say, yeah, because they made tons of merchandise of that rooster, but they also made, yeah, and you brought him up. They made a lot of merchandise for that pig too. But that pig not is even, not, he's, he's not, not even, even like, for long. no, he was like probably in yeah. less than like a minutes or two minutes worth of footage, and they fucking merchandise the hell of that at pig. And I'm just like, oh yeah, apparently, yeah, had, animals, yeah. It's Disney, had, what do you expect? Let's put porgs everywhere. I'm gonna yeah. market the shit out of porgs. Okay, look, I I understand like what happened <laughs> to the pork. I just liked that it, that the reason the porks came up was uh because because of the fucking birds on that island. Uh, it was a, the puffins, yeah. right? Yeah, they were just they was just infested with puffins, and rather than try to edit them out, they just put fucking porks on top of them. And there's the connection with the Kelly Marie Tran who voiced Raya. So it's all come together. Yeah. We've come full circle, folks. Yeah. Um. <laughs> So I, I just want to say that I also really like this. Um, I did think it was like a really nice change of pace for the most part from from Disney. I do get Kyle's um, concern that like we are kind of getting into a rut of like similar, like strong female uh, princesses. Um, I don't have a problem with that on on the surface. I but I'm just kind of in the same camp of like, OK, I would like to start seeing some different kind of stories. Um, but given that, I do think this is like Disney going way out of their way to try to subvert a lot of that. Um, I do like that it is like like Raya is like this badass sword warrior uh, wandering the wasteland uh, after a catastrophe. Um, the fucking fight scenes in this are just like so masterfully crafted. Like that fight scene uh, towards the end where she and... Um, uh namari her, her her old friend and the one that kind of stabbed her in the back um they're just like fighting in the middle of this like crumbling temple um and just watching them kind of fight around uh the building falling apart around them and rise just whipping out this chain sword um like that was just like really awesome to see i like that um i will say this movie did give me some and i'm sure a million people are also going to say it I did get some Avatar The Last Airbender vibes uh, off of this. There it is. Um, <laughs> and the other one is literally for uh, the only reason it came to my mind is because Melanie's been uh, uh, the, the anime Dr. Stone vibes um, only because there's a point in that where in that show where like the entire world got turned to stone because of like some unknown thing. And like the whole point is like trying to like undo the, the petrification process. And like, I don't know, it that just came to mind because Melanie's been watching that. Sure. Um, but no, like, I, I think the, the animation is really well done. Um, the thing I walked away from this movie with is we are approaching un- almost unsettling levels of uncanny with animation. Now, uh, Disney and Pixar have proven they can make almost photorealistic, uh, environments. Um, I've come to peace with that. But there are shots in this movie where I was uncomfortable with the smoothness of the facial animation. <laughs> My the one that stood out to me the most it is towards the beginning of the movie. I think it's where young Raya is talking with her dad in the kitchen, and they're like talking about like wanting to bring the countries together. And there's a close up on her dad's face. His face is too fluid. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it I know the exact I, me. I know the exact shot you're talking about because I had a similar it's thought. Too I'm just, fluid and I don't like it. I wasn't thinking it was necessarily too smooth. I was just thinking that it was very like, oh, this is actually very believable, like a uh, movement for yeah, like See, that's what I'm saying. Is like yeah. it is it is like 
I recognize like you are getting human uh movement like so close to reality that being put on these cartoon characters unsettles me. <laughs> <laughs> And again, and I'm, I'm assuming it's one of those things where they absolutely used a reference of like maybe even the 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 voice actor doing his performance and sure. then like mimicking that. It's just it's just like, and there's there's a lot of instances of this. Like the facial animation in this is like really well done, but it's just like almost too well done. <laughs> right. It's like guys, take a step back. We're gonna we're gonna approach the singularity here soon. Right, and then we don't have to make uh, live action movies anymore. They can just animate it all. Dude, literally, like, we don't need real people anymore. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, fucking, of course, because the amount of Di- the amount of power and money that Disney wields, they're the ones that are making all the advancements in these areas. Like, of the I, 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 I mean, totally... between, between this and then, like, live action stuff, kind of like with, um, with, like, Mandalorian and stuff, they've, like, made tons of advancements and, like, kind of rendering uh, mm-hmm. photorealistic environments, and they don't even need to be there. They just need to fucking film everything in, like, this bubble. Like, I, I, I'm just saying now, I fully believe that in our lifetime, we will see a movie starring a dead celebrity that they will have been able to recompile their voice from like voice lines from all of their old movies or whatever, and that the animation and rendering will be so convincing that you will not know that that person's not real anymore, and we will revive dead people to star in movies. I, um, I mean, Love, Death, and Robots had some different I still ones not, like that. I, I still have not watched that. I've heard it's good. We fucking reviewed it. I thought you watched it. We didn't review Love, Death, and Robots. I thought we did. We did not. Yikes. I think we had been to, but we didn't get to it. Oof. Well, oh, that you. explains it. <laughs> yeah, um... I I seem to recall like some years ago, and I think this was before uh, Disney bought Lucasfilm, uh, bought Star Wars and everything. Mm-hmm. I remember there being talks like I think George Lucas was trying to, or he might have even bought the rights to like using likenesses from old like like Humphrey Bogart and like some other old ass like uh, the, you know long dead uh, actors and stuff with the intention mm-hmm. of doing something like that. Right. Um, I wonder if he still retains the rights to any of that shit or if that's like something that's on the t- table still. Cause I mean, I... like that's not, it's becoming more and more of a possibility every day. Oh yeah. It's just like, and we, we've kind of had it where like they like in star Wars has done this not to great effect. I think like they revived general Tarkin and they like made princess that's Leia. Grand young again. Tarkin. Grand Mar- um, whatever. I'm not a fucking star Wars nerd. It's grandma Tarkin. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but like they did that and like it was okay but you could definitely tell they were fake um i'm just saying in the next like 30 years we're gonna get to a point where we can't tell anymore right we're gonna have I'm scared <laughs> we're gonna have poetic justice 2 with tupac shakur in it <laughs> i mean we revived tupac as a hologram i'm sure we're gonna yeah no the tupac technology specifically is already here <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, nobody, wants to, that is hologram. nobody wants to see more Tupac than me on this podcast. I guarantee it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever listened to a Tupac song before. I'm sure or at least knowingly know. watched listen to one. Yikes. Great. Um was there uh, yeah. anything left to uh, talk about for this movie? I, I did want to say my I think my one gripe about this movie is that um so as Rai is going to these different uh parts of of, of this land. Uh, she basically picks up someone from each per- uh, from each land. So like, uh, she picks up this uh, this boy who runs like a like who's who's like a chef on this shrimp boat. Um, she joins the joins the crew, and then uh, she picks up this baby and her three monkey companions. Um, and then they pick up this basically Mongolian guy um, to team up with them. Um, I just felt like these characters like. The I don't feel like they were fleshed out nearly as much as they could have been, um, and that just has to do with the nature of them being picked oh, yeah. up along the way. That like you know in that right. order, they get as much development. Like if yeah, this movie like, had like an extra like ten minutes, fifteen minutes, but they're already like for well, an animated movie, an hour forty minutes is already getting kind of a uh, kind of long. So right. Well, here here's where you can draw a good comparison. So uh, Kubo and the Two Strings. 
he picked up the beetle and the monkey, didn't he? Mm-hmm. He did, yeah. And there was a lot more with just those two characters that you can kind of love them and kind of like get into them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like there's more time with them to understand and there's bi- a bigger impact with that other than like what they presented in this movie. I right. feel like the, the the bigger thing with Kubo though was is because those two characters that he picks up are related to characters that we you don't know at the time, but I mean you grow you grow more attached to those characters once you realize that they're, you know, his mom and dad and stuff, so. Yeah, but I feel like you still you're with the characters for a majority of the movie though that you you start to like them and you're more um invested in them. But with this one uh it was like the mongolian guy was only here for maybe like the yeah. last half hour of the movie yeah i was gonna say like i don't think tong gets a lot like i we get to we get like some base background like he's the last person of his village because everyone else got turned to stone and it's kind of implied that he like his wife and kid got taken behind which you actually do see at the end of the movie um but yeah i like you're kind of with boone who's the 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 kid who drives the boat you get a little bit with him. You get a nice action, um, action scene with the baby. Uh, but yeah, Tong, I feel like really is really under was really underdeveloped. He doesn't really like he didn't get a lot of spotlight. Yeah, I feel like it's one of those things where they're absolutely going to um, fran- uh, is a, it was a franchise. I guess would be the right word for this, where they're going to like turn it into <sighs> and like see, that's going to have like a, a show on Disney Plus and everything. I, yeah, it's okay. I, I really don't want like a show. Like I don't. Like I feel like this 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 story was very self contained. Like they split, they do an info dump at the beginning, saying, "Hey, the catastrophe happened. All the dragons went away." And by the time everyone's friends again, I, like I fucking hate how it begins, where she's like, "I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this." I'm like I'm not thinking that at all. You got the wrong person. Lady. I I did think that the, <laughs> the info dump at the beginning was a little much, just because I think it just went on a little too long. Because they're literally they're literally just trying to explain, like, okay, here's how our entire in the span of like five minutes. Actually, you know what? There was another thing. It didn't necessarily bother me that much, but it was something worth noting is that they do throw around some terminology and stuff in this movie that it's definitely out of place for I'm imagining a movie that's supposed to be taking place in the past like when they're uh when they when she, when she calls their fucking rivals like an undercut haircut and like uh when they're talking about the little boy dancing calling like popping and locking and stuff that sort of thing I, there's, yeah. there's a lot of that in this movie <laughs> I took it, I took it as it's a fantasy land so we're allowing an accurate that was and that was what I decided on too. I was just like, okay, that's that's completely fine. But it's still it took me off guard like every time it happened. So I'm just like I, honestly, okay, I'm whatever. when it comes to stuff like that, as long as they're not mentioning specific technology that wouldn't exist in their thing, I'm fine with like anachronistic terms. Sure. Yeah. Well, what about this one where she's like talking about a school project? That one was that one, that that one was <laughs> that one was the big <laughs> one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that one's even in the trailer. Yeah. Um, but no, like I, I think overall, I, I really like this movie. I, I would watch it again, um, yeah. just to watch like the fight scenes and stuff. Um, I thought of I'm just kind of hoping... holy thing. What? <laughs> or the beginning where she's trying to get into the temple, and she has the bug set off all the traps. She yeah. just ends up crawling it anyways. So what was the fucking point of having the bug set off the traps when she just crawled through it anyways? Uh, I think it was just to set it off ahead of time because I feel like <laughs> well, he was I, he was traveling fast enough that he was able to set off the traps. Well, cause I, yeah, because I think like the traps were set like in the middle of where that like cage would come oh. down on her, so he would yeah. zip over those buttons fast enough. Uh, but she could she wouldn't been able to there, get out of the way in time. There was enough space for her to crawl underneath. So well, if I, it didn't I, get the, the cage bug, would have it didn't down him. and grabbed her. And put her in the cage, but like when the cage is fully down, you can, there's enough space to get underneath it. It's, it's more it of looked, like the cage being set off. It looked like it was just rope, not even a cage. It was just like a, a circular piece of rope or something, like yeah. a circular well, net. It might have been one of those instances too, where all this shit's built to stop adults, and they didn't think about it ahead of time when they're training a kid on this stuff. Because, <laughs> but then she does it with the fucking child. Yeah, and the yeah. bug wasn't even with her. Yeah, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know, man. Anyway, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't they reset the traps? I'm just saying. 
I guess. <laughs> well, because it's just it's cool. It's cool to look at. But it's yeah. cool that it's cool for them to set off traps ahead of time because they know what they're doing. I guess. Yeah, they're they're capable. They're capable. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Well, uh, do you guys have anything else you want to say before we start wrapping up here? And another thing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I got nothing. Uh, I just I want to talk about. I, I want to watch more stuff with her in it because I love uh, Aquafina's voice. She's you, you made the note before recording that she sounds like um, Michaela Deeds, who voices uh, Amethyst on Steven yeah, Universe. And she bit. absolutely does, and uh, yeah, uh, I, I love her voice. I when they were playing the ads for um, Crazy Rich Asians uh, uh, at Target where I work, um, every time she popped on, it just it brought me a little bit of joy. <laughs> So I'd like right. to see more things with her in it. There you go. Um, well, guys, there you go. There's our review of Ryan and the Last Dragon. Um, like I said, you can watch this on Disney Plus if you want to, uh, if you want to pay a little extra. Well, though, honestly, when I went to the movie theater, both our tickets together was about 30 bucks. So I believe that's know, their intention for them. Pricing yeah, it yeah, it's it's. I'd rather watch this stuff on a big screen. I'm just a purist like that. But, you know, if you're if you're feeling a little iffy about it, you know, at home too. You want to know um, something funny? What's what? that? I couldn't get it to work on my Xbox for uh, Kim or whatever, so I ended up watching it on my fucking phone. Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> so you watched it on a cinema screen, and I watched it on my cell phone. Technology, so like, you guys. We're living in the future, man. Um, but uh, let us know what you thought about Raya uh, on our various pages. Uh, you know, look in the links below. You'll you'll find it. Um, yeah, it was a good movie. I liked it. Good job, Disney. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, yep. Everybody, thanks for listening. We'll catch you all again next time. And uh, till then, be safe. Later. Thanks for listening. You can find all the links to our social media pages in the episode description. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and join our Discord. You can listen to us wherever you get your podcasts. The Ink and Pink Club is happy to be part of the Geekly Grind Podcast Network. We'll see you next time.